I speak to you today in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So often when we talk about St. Stephen in the life of the church, we talk about what makes him unique. Specifically, we usually focus on the fact that he was the first Christian who was killed for his faith. Our readings today center on this fact. In this day and age when so many Christians in our developed Western countries live lives of comfort and luxury, it's easy to forget the generations of those who have went before us, who suffered and died for their faith. A Roman Catholic Church commission in the year 2000 found that there have been more Christian martyrs in the last 100 years than in the first 1900 years of the church combined. And even today, martyrdom is a real threat to Christians living in some parts of the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. So we do well to remember St. Stephen, the proto-martyr, or first martyr, for the faith. But what I would like to focus on today are the broader circumstances which led to Stephen's death, because they reveal much about the life of the early church, and I believe provide us with an important example to emulate in our life here today in Swift Current in 2021. I want to begin by reading a very important part of scripture about St. Stephen that surprisingly was not included in our assigned readings for today. It's from Acts 6, verses 1 through 7, just before the passage we read about Stephen's killing. It reads this. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to serve at the tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of Jewish priests became obedient to the faith. There are three points I'd like for us to take away from this story today. First is that social justice was a major focus of the early church. It was taken for granted that the church would be providing for the needs of the poor, and when problems arose which needed dedicated leadership for this ministry, the church pulled together and commissioned dedicated leadership for this ministry, seven gifted servants. Servants, we are told, who are full of the spirit and wisdom to be commissioned for this task. Now, the Greek word which is translated into servant is diakoneo, from which we also derive that English word deacon. This is why priests are always ordained deacons first. It is a way to ensure that the church remains rooted in its vision for social justice, that we never stray too far from our Christian identity as servants for the poor, the hungry, and the downtrodden in this world. The second point I'd like to draw from this story today is that ministries of social justice are not separate from ministries of the word. Over the past 70 years, our society has went through a process of secularization unlike any other. There have been many instances of social service organizations that began as Christian organizations, but then for many good reasons evolved into secular institutions that embrace people of different faiths or even no faith at all in order to accomplish their social justice goals. This has happened for many good reasons, and has resulted in these organizations making an even greater impact in our society for good. But the temptation is then to assume that achieving the goals of social justice are somehow separate from Christian life. 
we come to the story of the commissioning of the seven deacons, and we focus on how its purpose was to free up the 12 for prayer and teaching the word of God. And our vision of what those prayers and those teachings contained all of a sudden separates the things of this world from more heavenly things. But that would be a mistake. The purpose of the gospel is not to separate heaven from earth, but to see them come into closer contact. That miraculous vision of heaven that was revealed to Stephen as he was being stoned to death, that was a bringing together of heaven and earth in that moment. It was a culmination of the justice work that the church as a whole was devoted to from the earliest times. Now, as a bit of an aside, or not really, I wish I could reassure you that your work for social justice will be well received in this world. St. Stephen sets our expectations appropriately about the consequences that await those who seek to upset the existing social order. Those who like the world as it is will not want transformation to occur. In fact, they will fight it tooth and nail, even to the point of forsaking their personal integrity, using lies and misrepresentation as they did against Stephen to ensure that their interests continue to be privileged against those of others. Having appropriate expectations is why the Christian faith cannot be ultimately removed from work for social justice in this world. The moment those working for social justice start to assume that they are signing up for anything other than a form of martyrdom is the moment that the movement they sought to push forward starts to collapse. They just will not have the perseverance that is needed to see it through. So even though many social service organizations have evolved into secular organizations, those organizations who continue to thrive are those whose leadership maintains a Christian type of vision in their own lives. It is only those who enter into it from the start, knowing that the cause of justice will come at great personal expense. Those are the individuals who will persevere and whose organizations will continue to bring heaven and earth closer together. The third and final point I want to make for us today is that social justice is based in the very structures of our leadership. We are told that the reason the seven servants were commissioned to serve tables was because there was discrimination going on between Hebrew-speaking Jews and Greek-speaking Jews, the Greek-speaking widows, we are told, were being neglected in the distribution of food. Now, in order to understand what is going on here, we have to understand a little bit about Jerusalem at this time 2,000 years ago. Even though Jerusalem was the ancient homeland of the Jews, they were a persecuted minority in the Roman Empire. Through the generations, many had been carried off and made slaves in exile. And with the main language of the empire being Greek, these slaves and their descendants in various places stopped speaking Hebrew and adopted the language of the empire. This is why the Old Testament was translated into Greek sometime in the third century before Christ. There were fewer and fewer Jewish people who could speak Hebrew. When Greek-speaking Jews made their way back to Jerusalem, they encountered challenges integrating into the Hebrew-speaking communities. And so they formed their own Greek-speaking synagogues. This is something that displaced people even today can relate to. We naturally gravitate to people from our own culture. It's apparent from the passage I read that the early believers in Jesus came from both Hebrew and Greek-speaking backgrounds, and this cultural tension was an ongoing struggle. But look closely at what the early church did to address the problem. First of all, it says they heard the grumbling. They didn't ignore it. They take it as a sign of a problem to be worked out. And then they called everyone together to talk about it directly and to work out a solution. And now look at the solution that they come up with. They appoint seven people with Greek names. Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. Scholars agree that these seven servants were likely all members of the Greek-speaking party. 
So when faced with a cultural divide, the early church did not commission deacons according to population. They didn't commission a proportion of Hebrew deacons to serve the Hebrews and a proportion of Greek-speaking deacons to serve the Greeks. They commissioned all Greeks because there was a structural injustice that, for at least a time, needed to be decisively and assertively corrected. What we really have here was the first instance in the church of an affirmative action hiring policy. I'll let that sit with you for a second. Now notice something that's maybe even more scandalous. Notice that it wasn't a decision that came down from on high. The 12 asked the people themselves to put forward those who were full of the spirit and wisdom. It was the people themselves who recognized that the Greeks, those who were the ones who had been discriminated against, were the wise ones. It was they who were uniquely gifted by their experience of discrimination to lead the church in this next stage of correction. Our Anglican Church of Canada has a thing or two to learn from this model of leadership. We are way too top-heavy in the authority we give to bishops, and as a result, we struggle with decisively and assertively correcting injustices on the ground. Our decision-making in these matters should be more lay-led, because it is not only the bishops who are full of spirit and wisdom. The model that we are given in Scripture in Acts chapter 6 is quite the opposite. It's a model that is built on mutual love and care and respect. It's built on a heart for social justice, even when that will come at great personal cost. And it is built on trust in the Holy Spirit's work in the laity. Some of you are probably aware that we here in Swift Current have a long history of Christian social justice in our province of Saskatchewan, in fact. We are the birthplace here of socialized medicine in North America. We were healthcare region number one. In fact, one of St. Stephen's church leaders, Dr. O.M. Irwin, was a key figure in negotiating this initiative with the provincial government in 1946. But did you also know that St. Stephen's has a much longer history of social justice? In 1910, one of our first rectors, the Reverend John, Reverend John Swalwell, started the Swift Current Library. He was a Cambridge-educated astronomer who later entered the ministry. Swalwell saw the need in Swift Current to make educational resources accessible to all, regardless of income level, and he rallied other members of the community to make it happen. In 1914, St. Stephen's established a local chapter of the Brotherhood of St. Andrew, a men's group that visited newcomers to the community as well as people in the hospital to make sure their needs were attended to by the church. In the 1930s, our Sunday school superintendent at St. Stephen's, a man by the name of Arthur Thornycroft, started, started what would become the Swift Current Minor Hockey League. He formed a hockey team from the St. Stephen's Sunday School boys and then challenged other Swift Current churches to do the same. And they created a boys hockey league to provide a healthy and wholesome source of recreation to keep the boys engaged and out of trouble. In 1956, diocesan synod delegates from St. Stephen's brought to motion, a motion to synod to change the diocesan canons to allow women vestry members. This motion passed at the 1961 synod coming into effect in 1963. And in 1964, the first two women were elected to St. Stephen's Vestry, Mrs. R. Naylor and Mrs. W. Nickel, some of the first female vestry members in the whole diocese. In 1975, Betty Garrett, trailblazing wife of local rancher Bob Garrett, was ordained one of the first female deacons in Canada. And in 1979, she was ordained a priest, the first woman to be ordained priest in this diocese. Our church has been involved in many social justice initiatives throughout the years, and they continue to the present day as we seek to discern together how best to support and care for the marginalized and those who are discriminated against in our community. We partner with the Newcomer Welcome Center in various initiatives to support immigrants. We are a key part of our ministerial refugee committee, bringing refugees from war-torn lands to find a new, and peaceful home 
in Swift Current. We've started to reach out and build relationships with the LGBTQ2S plus community. And we are seeking to grow and learn and further the causes of truth and reconciliation with Indigenous and Métis people with whom we share this land. These are challenging issues, make no doubt about it. And the solution to them is not as simple as just commissioning people to the task. But I want to encourage you today, keep it up, St. Stephen's. Keep striving for social justice. Keep coming together when we know there is a problem that needs addressing. Keep talking with one another and working towards solutions and know from the start that it will never be an easy task. The closer we get to a solution, the greater the personal cost will be. May God bless us as we seek to bring heaven and earth a little closer together each day here in Southwest Saskatchewan and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.